Next week is going to be Palm Sunday. And uh, next week is going to be Palm Sunday. And, of course, the week after is Easter. And uh, I, I wanted to look at John chapter 11 uh, tonight uh, because it's really, John chapter 11 is like the setup. It's the big setup for what was to happen uh, when Jesus marched into the city, what we call the triumphal entry. And um, it didn't turn out to be very triumphal because he ended up being crucified. Of course, it was triumphal in God's sight, but not in man's sight. But it's really the big setup. Uh, John chapter 11, of course, is the story of Lazarus <clears throat> who had died. And those of you who are familiar with scriptures have probably read it uh, many times. And I thought we would just look at this because as we're approaching that time, uh, what happened in John chapter 11 probably was maybe a few weeks or maybe a few months before the crucifixion because he was on his way for the last time to Jerusalem and he was really like the setup. If you look at chapter 11, actually we're going to jump back to John chapter 10 um, and uh, just to kind of you know, read into this. And if you look at verse 39... Jesus was uh, laying, laying out the truth to the folks in Jerusalem, uh, the leaders of the churches, uh, the leaders of the, of, the, of, the, of the Jewish nation. The church didn't exist at that time. But the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders, and they didn't like him, and they really were looking for ways to get rid of him. And... Uh, it says after, you know, Jesus discoursed uh, in chapter 10, and we're just going to look at verse 39. They sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand, meaning the religious rulers. They wanted to kill him. He left, and he went away beyond Jordan into the place where John had first baptized, and there he abode, a place called Perea. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spoke of this man were true, and many believed on him there. Now, in John's gospel, if you, if you know anything about the gospels, the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic gospels. And that word means they have like a similar viewpoint. And there are a lot of similarities in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, but in John, there's really a lot of different accounts of different things that the other ones don't include. John covers a lot of the ministry in Jerusalem when he was there. The others kind of focus on when he was in Galilee and other parts. And what we're about to read now, this thing about Lazarus, the other, the other gospel writers did not include it. And I believe it was the purpose of the Holy Spirit to <clears throat> save that story for John's gospel because in John's gospel, well, if you know anything about the gospels, Matthew portrays Jesus as the Messiah King. Uh, Mark portrays Jesus as the servant of, of Jehovah, the servant of Yahweh. Uh, Luke presents... Jesus as the man, the, the human. He presents the human side of Christ and his humanity. But John presents the deity of Jesus Christ. And there's no miracle that quite expresses or explains the deity of Christ as the one we're going to read here in John chapter 11. It's about Jesus raising a man from the dead. Now, he had done this before in the other Gospels. They talk about uh, Jairus' daughter who had died. Jesus brought her back to life. They talk about the widow's son who was being carried to his, to his uh, grave site, and Jesus raised him back to life. But this miracle has a special significance. It's just a few weeks or maybe a month or so before his entry into Jerusalem. And let's just read it and read a little bit here. It says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It's about two miles uh, outside of Jerusalem to the east of Jerusalem. And it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. That, that is an event that happened later, but John records it here. Mary and Martha, we know about them. They were very uh, devoted uh, supporters of Jesus Christ. They both loved him and Lazarus. They loved him. They were very close. Uh, we read the story of how when Jesus went to visit their house, Mary sat at his feet and Martha was busy you know, cooking dinner. And Martha complained. Just imagine that. Somebody complaining to Jesus saying, Mary's not helping me. And Jesus said, Martha, you know, Mary's doing the better thing. You know, but anyway, you know this story, okay? That's, that's, that's the people. That's the family. Uh, Lazarus became sick, in verse 3. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now Jesus 
This is toward the end of his ministry. He'd been going around for about three years doing all these miracles, raising dead people, healing sick people. So the sisters of Lazarus figured, hey, you know, Jesus, he heals the sick people. His good friend is sick. We'll send a message to him, and he'll come and he'll heal. He'll hear, uh, he will he, uh, heal Lazarus. Okay? Now, the thing is, Jesus, when he heard this, it says, Jesus heard that. He said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, Jesus knew what was going on. He knew what was happening. He did not immediately get up and go to heal his friend Lazarus. Now, Jesus loved Martha and his sister Lazarus. And when he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he kicked back two days in the same place where he was. He says, well, okay, he's sick. Now, if it were me, and I knew I could heal somebody, or I knew somebody that I thought could heal, I would expect him to get up and get on the quickest camel that he could get, or whatever, and just get here. They were two days away, or two days' journey away. I would expect him, and I'm sure that Mary and Martha would expect Jesus to just be there. Where's my friend Lazarus? I want to lay hands on him. I want to heal him, because they've seen him do it before. But God had another purpose. He had another purpose. Listen to what it says. He says in verse 7, Then after that, after two days, he said, Let us go unto Judea again. And his disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and you want to go there again? And Jesus said, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not, because he sees the light of the world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. These things said uh, he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Now Jesus was very clear when the Bible talks about sleep, it talks about death. Now it's not talking about soul sleep. We believe if somebody dies, their soul goes to be with the Lord, but their body goes to sleep and it gets buried in the ground. So when his disciples heard that, and sometimes his disciples were so dull, you know, they were like thick. His disciples heard that. And he said, well, if he's sleeping, he must be better. I'm taking a nap, he's sleeping good. Howbeit, Jesus spoke of his what? His death. Jesus let his friend die. He let his friend die. He spoke of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them, clearly, plainly, Lazarus is dead. He's dead. He's gone. And he says, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Say, so if, if I could have been there to heal him, and I let him die because I stayed here. Well, you know what? Jesus could have spoke that word and healed him. He was two days away. He could have been two million miles away and spoke the word and healed Lazarus. But he let him die. And he's telling his friends, he says, it's a good thing that I did that. Why? To the intent that you may believe. See, it was a setup. It was a setup. Things were getting set up. Everything was, God was ordering everything to happen exactly as it needed to happen. Because Jesus was about to do something, one of the last acts that nobody could deny who he was. It was a setup. Okay? Listen to what it says. In verse 16. Then said Thomas, who is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us go that we may die with him. A nice positive thinker. Okay. Verse 17. <laughs> That's another message. Verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that they had lain in the grave. He had been dead four days. That meant that he had died, really, when he, Jesus might have first heard about it. Because it was like a two-day journey. And he waited two days. And, I mean, Lazarus was gone. And it says, now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs, about um, uh, one and three quarters, maybe two miles. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now, now, now look at the picture. Lazarus must have been a well-known, well-respected man in the city of Jerusalem because, you know, if, if a common person died, there wouldn't be a lot of leaders. When it talks about the Jews, it's really talking about some of the leaders of, of the nation. So Lazarus must have been fairly prominent. He must have been well-known. There were a lot of people at his funeral. A lot of well-known people at his funeral. I mean, big names. Sort of like when Manorino died <laughs> in New Kensington. For those of you that are from this area, if not, yeah, okay, you don't, don't know that story. We won't tell that story. All right. There were some big names there. There were some folks from 
from Jerusalem, they wouldn't just go to anybody's funeral. They were at Lazarus' funeral. Many of the Jews came to comfort them concerning their brother. Okay? So here's the thing. They're, they're lying around. And when they had a funeral back then, it wasn't just like a day and a half and see you later. It was, it was like a week-long thing. They would mourn and they would weep and they would even hire people to come in and mourn and weep. They would hire a band to, to mourn at the funeral, right? So this was going on. This is like a, a week-long affair here. And they're crying and they're weeping and they're mourning. And Martha, in verse 20, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary sat still at the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, if you'd just been here, Lord, if you'd just been here, if you'd only... If you would only have been nearby. Again, he could have spoke the word wherever he was and healed Lazarus. But see, Martha didn't understand. And the Jews didn't understand. And the disciples didn't understand. And we don't understand sometimes why some things have to die. You know, God can get glory by bringing the dead back to life. God can get glory by reviving and restoring things that once seemed like as though they were dead. Sometimes he got to let things dry up before he can bring them back. Well, listen to what he says. She says, if you'd just been here, my brother would have not died. But I know, and here's the faith of Martha. She could have been angry. She could have been bitter. She could have been mad. But she said, I know that even now, whatsoever you ask of God, God will give it to you. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Well, Martha, being a believer, she said, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. They believed in the resurrection. They believed there was going to come a time when the dead in Christ would rise. Some folks try to make you think that the Jews didn't teach that, but they certainly believed it. And this was before the cross. This was before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They knew throughout the Old Testament where it said in the Psalms, you will not allow my body to see corruption and so forth. They, they understood that. So Martha says, yeah, I know he's going to rise at the resurrection. And Jesus said unto her, see, she didn't understand. Jesus knew what he was getting ready to do. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And we need to land on that verse for a minute. Because no matter what's going on with us, no matter what kind of, what kind of death is looming over us, we have a God who is life. He is life in his very self. It's not, he doesn't control life. He, doesn't, he is life. He is the resurrection. He is our hope. Everything that we need is in him. He told Martha, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He that believes in me. That's the key word. That's the, that's, that's the key phrase here. Because there's some folks that think that everybody's going to live forever in heaven. There's some folks that think everybody goes to heaven. Everybody goes to heaven. Well, you know, the way I feel, yeah, I'll let everybody in, but I'm not God. See, God said, his words, I just had a conversation with a guy not too long ago. And he tried to tell me, well, everybody's going toward the light. I said, right, well, they might be going toward some light, but the only way you go toward this light is through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the word says. You know, I, I'm, I'm not being hateful. I'm not being, you know, uh, exclusive. I'm not. That's just that's what Jesus said. He said, whosoever shall believe on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You'll never die. Somebody said, man, I, I feel like I'm dying. Well, you know, physically, yeah, our body, unless Jesus comes back, physically, someday we're all going to die. We're going to be in a grave somewhere. But ultimately, we're going to live forever in our body. We're going to live forever in a body. That's the promise of God. This body I'm living in right now, if, if, if Jesus doesn't come back in the next, I don't know how many years, uh, you know, it's, it's going to get buried in the ground. But someday it's going to be raised again, and I'm going to live forever in a body. I'm always going to be me. We're going to recognize each other. Well, I don't think we're going to be in old bodies because we're going to have new, perfect, incorruptible bodies. I'll never get older, never get sick, or never hurt. But this is the promise that, that Jesus made to us. And this is the promise that these were holding on to. Now listen, he's getting ready to do such, a, a, such an a, unimaginably uh, amazing miracle. And it's all a setup. See, he's getting ready to give life, setting him up for his death. 
It's a setup. Okay. She said to him in verse 27, we're just going to read through the, the chapter. She said to him, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. That's about the simple gospel message you can preach. You know, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God which should come into the world? That's a confession of faith. That's about us. I mean, we try to make it, you know, give it like three and a half pages. Okay. And when she had so said, she went her way and she called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master has come and calls for thee. Verse 29. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus was not yet come into town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out. They followed her and they said, she's going to go mourn at the graveside. She's going to go to the graveside and weep. So the Jews and all their friends that were there with them, they said, let's go. Let's go and mourn with her because that's what they did. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down on his feet and she said the same thing. If you had just been here, if you had just been here, he wouldn't have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. This is the humanity of Jesus Christ. You know, death is painful when you have to say goodbye to somebody, even like a pet. <laughs> it's painful to say goodbye. Death brings pain. Even if you know somebody is really saved, I know, I know some of you are dealing with you know, our, our, our brother, his, his brother is, is dying, and, but he's saved, and, it's, and it hurts to have to say goodbye. It hurts, that, that thought hurts. But if you know they're saved, at least you know you'll see them again. But even in death, you know, Jesus knew what he was getting ready to do. He knew what was going to happen, but he groaned. His heart was breaking. And I don't think it was breaking so much because Lazarus had died, but it was breaking because he saw people weeping and crying. He saw the effect of death on his creation. God didn't create us to die. When he created Adam, he put them in the garden. He never created them to die. It's sin that brings death. See, this is why when you, we hear some of these folks talk and they, and they question, you know, there's no God, how can a loving God, blah, 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 and they talk about all the pain and evil in the world, that's all because of sin. We're responsible for that. Maybe not directly, but we're responsible. Babies die. Babies before they're old enough to understand or do anything right or wrong. Sometimes babies die. Why? It's because of sin. Maybe not their sin, but sin. Sin brings death. That's why we die. Okay? Jesus groaned in the spirit. Have you ever been there? Have you ever groaned in your spirit? You've been so weighted down and so burdened. And he said, where have you laid him? And Jesus knew where they laid him. He said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And verse 35, the shortest verse, but maybe the, one of the heaviest verse in, 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 in verses in the Bible. Jesus, what did he do? He wept. He cried. He was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He knew he was going to bring him back from the dead. He wasn't weeping for Lazarus. But he was weeping when he saw all these people crying and mourning and just heartbroken because they lost their loved one. And maybe he was weeping because he knew what was coming. The setup was in. He was, he was getting ready to do something that would leave the Jews no recourse. Okay? Okay. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Therefore, again, Jesus groaned in himself, thinking, what are these people thinking? He comes to the grave, and it was a cave, and the stone was laid upon it. And he said, take the stone away. And we all know the story. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, you've been in there four days. You know, they didn't have, like, they didn't do what they do today in funeral homes. Like, so he'd been there for four days. He stinketh. Or stinks. He's been there four days. It's one thing 
When Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, she had, just, she had just died. When he raised the, the son that was being carried to the, to the grave, he had, he had just recently died. But this guy had been buried, wrapped up and buried, because when they would bury him, they would wrap him up like a mummy. And, and he was there. He was dead. Graveyard dead. The other times that Jesus rose people from the dead, they might have been able to explain it away. You know, say, well, maybe it wasn't really dead or maybe. But this one. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you would believe me, you should see the glory of God? See, look, listen to what Jesus is getting ready to do. He's getting ready to speak life into death. He's getting ready to raise someone who was dead and gone. His spirit was already in Abraham's bosom. But the giver of life, the author of life, life himself was getting ready to move and act to bring life to a dead man. Just like he did to us when we got saved. You know, I was walking dead. We were in the van and we saw a kid, just a kid that had a Grateful Dead t-shirt on. Albert said, that says Grateful Dead. Never could figure out what that name meant. <laughs> because people dying without Christ ain't grateful. And I don't think they had Christ. Okay. Anyway, I'm not, getting, I'm not going there. All right. He says, you're going to see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that you have heard me. And I knew that you hear me always, but because of the people which stand by me, I said that the day might believe. See, Jesus was saying and doing all these things in the open to, be, to make an unmistakable claim to be who he said he was, the Messiah of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, God in the flesh. Nobody can raise somebody who's been dead in the tomb for four days. They've tried. They're trying to figure out ways to make people live forever. Scientists and, and doctors, and, and uh, they're trying to figure out ways to prolong life. You know, they're, they're, they're freeze, they'll freeze. If you've got enough money, they'll freeze you. They'll freeze you until they find a cure for your disease, and they want to, like, revive you again. There are places where they got people frozen stiff. I mean, they're, they're, they're frozen. People have a lot of money. They want to live forever. You know, the only way we can live forever is through faith in Christ. Amen. They don't understand that. They're trying to find a way around. But Jesus said, listen, I'm saying all this, I'm doing all this, so that you will know what this is all about. Jesus never, Jesus didn't do things in a mysterious way. He let everybody know exactly what was going on. He says, I pray, Father, I know you hear me all the time, but I'm saying this so they'll understand who I am. And they'll see incontrovertible evidence of who I am. We know the story. When he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with his grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. What a great miracle. I'm sure Martha and Mary were blessed and excited. But here's the thing. Do you know somewhere down the line, Lazarus had to die again. People will say this was a resurrection. This wasn't a resurrection. Resurrection is like forever. The only person ever been resurrected was Jesus. We'll be resurrected someday. Lazarus was revived. I, I was talking to Jehovah's Witness one time. He came knocking on my door. He said, oh, there's like 14 resurrections in the Bible. I said, no, there's not. There's only one. All these other people, they've been brought to life. But you know what? They had to die again. Somewhere down the line, we don't know how, when, or where, but Lazarus had to die again. I wonder how Lazarus felt when he came back. Anyway, I don't know. All right, we don't know that. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, what? Believed on him. They couldn't deny that Jesus was the God-man that he claimed to be. See, now that's important. But what happened was, some of them, it says in verse 46, went their ways to the Pharisees and they told them the things that Jesus had done. See, here's the setup. This is why Jesus, this is why this happened. You know, I'm sure Lazarus would have been perfectly happy to stay in paradise. I'm sure he would have been perfectly happy. He was, his sisters were sad. His friends were sad. But, um, you know, Lazarus was a believer. He was, in a, he was in a nice place. He was in Abraham's bosom. 
I'm sure he would have been perfectly happy to stay there. But he was brought back. And for this reason. So that when they saw what happened. See, here's the setup. This is what's going to be setting up Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. Here's the setup. They went back and they told the Pharisees. They told the religious, the high hats and the suits and ties. They said, do you know what we just saw? This Jesus that you guys think is a, is a rascal and a scoundrel and a, and a charlatan? That you're trying to tell everybody that he's a false prophet? That he's doing things by the power of the devil? You know what he did? Our friend Lazarus was graveyard dead. They had the obituary in the paper. And he came and he spoke the word. He didn't do any magical incantations or didn't do any kind of hocus pocus. He just said, come forth. And that Lazarus, he came back to life. Wow. He must be who he says he is. And you would think that them, them folks back in Jerusalem would have said, wow, praise the Lord. Praise Yahweh. Praise the Lord. Praise God. He is. He's the one. Oh, no. See, I want to tell you something. Religion isn't easily convinced. And a matter of fact, matter of fact, that spirit, listen to what they said. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what are we going to do about this guy? We got to do something about him. He does many miracles. If we let him alone, they're going to believe on him. We got to do something about him. It reminds me of the story of Elijah. Remember the story of Elijah? Who he went up on Mount Carmel and uh, they had the, the challenge with the prophets of Baal. You all know that story. And, and, and Elijah said, you know, there was King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. We all know about Queen Jezebel. That name alone says something. And, and Elijah said, okay. There was a famine for seven years, and uh, Elijah said, okay, we're going to see who, who, who really is God. And we know how the thing is, they, they, they put the sacrifices there and put the wood there. And Elijah told the prophets of Baal 450, he said, go ahead, call on your God. See if he'll consume your sacrifices. They went about all day cutting themselves and jumping and screaming and singing and doing everything. They knew what to do, and nothing, nothing happened. That, that, that sacrifice, that cow just lay there rotten, okay? And Elijah made fun of him and says, oh, maybe he's in the bathroom, maybe he's on vacation, or maybe he's whatever, doing whatever, ha, ha, ha. And he's making a big joke. But when it came Elijah's turn, he found some kind of water to pour on there, and he, all he said was, Lord, show who you are. And a fire came. And you would think a great miracle like that would shake the place, and there would be a great revival, and everybody would get saved. But what did Jezebel say? He said, hey, she said, hey, Elijah, tomorrow at this time, you're going to be like one of them. You know, Satan won't be convinced. You can't, you can't convince Satan. You can't convince an antichrist to believe. I really, I really believe in all my heart that sometimes, you know, there are, there are places, and we talked about this before, when Jesus couldn't do many miracles. I believe we don't see a whole lot of miracles like, you know, like in the, in, in, in the first century because people wouldn't believe even if they did see him. It's unbelief. These Pharisees got together and said, we got to do something about this guy. So he's trouble. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Man, we're going to lose our seat. We're going to lose our power. We're going to lose our position. We're going to lose the respect. If we let this guy go. He's doing this stuff and he's not doing it according to our rules. That's what religion says. That's what religion does. When God starts to move, how many of you have experienced God starts to move in your life, and then folks have been going to church for 30 and 40 years, they start getting up in the air. When you start learning how to really worship God, and we were talking about this this morning, you know, worshiping in the dance. Man, there's some places, you talk about dancing in church, man, they'll throw you out quicker than the, than the trash on Thursday. But, you know, worship God. When, whenever, whenever you express, whenever you really get on fire for God, all them people hanging around you, they used to know you and say, you got too religious. You have too much religion. You know, actually, you want to go to church once in a while, that's all right. Let's keep it there on Sunday morning. Don't give me that mess. That's, that's, what, 
you know, they, they were set in their ways. They were, they were leaders of the church in Jerusalem. They were the, you know, the high hats and the suits and ties, and they were the, the Pharisees and the scribes. And they say, man, we got to do something about this guy. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied. God prophesied through him, being that he was a high priest in his position. As an individual, he was, he was rotten. But God prophesied through him. And spoke to those, those individuals, those Pharisees. They didn't realize they were hearing a prophecy of what they were about to do to the Lamb of God. Amen. He said, and this he spake, uh, he not of himself, verse 51, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. See, it was a setup. This thing he did with Lazarus started the ball rolling that would end up in his crucifixion. It was something that they could not tolerate. They, you know, the other things, they could kind of shrug them off or set them aside or brush over. But now he's raising people from the dead. That's not something that they could explain away. And they realized they was either going to have to worship him or kill him. And they chose to kill him. And it's, it's no different than what people deal with today. And what people, you know, how many people they, they confronted with Christ. They're confronted with the truth of the gospel. And they'll find a million different ways. We've all experienced it. Maybe in one time or another in our lives, we've done the same thing. Confronted with incontrovertible evidence about who Jesus is, and we say, nah. Uh-uh. And we try to kill them. We want to shut them Christians up. That's what we talked about this morning. And Satan's evangelists are going out trying to shut up Christians, trying to get rid of God everywhere. But you know what? You can't stop the truth. You can't shut up God. He's going to speak his word. His word is going to be preached. Uh, the, the power of God is going to go forth. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is going to be present in the body of Christ. It doesn't matter what kind of laws they pass or what they do with, with uh, statues of Ten Commandments. It doesn't matter because God's will will be done in earth as in heaven. And he's going to use the body of Christ, his church, to do it. And, and the world's not going to applaud us. In fact, as, as we go forward and as God moves forward in his church, there are those folks who are sitting up in high places who are being threatened. Their position, their power, their respect is being threatened by the move of God. I remember, I know I gave the testimony, I remember when I got saved. And my dad asked me, what in the world is wrong with you? What got into you? That's what he said. What got into you? And I said, I got saved. He said, well, he says, you going to church? I said, yeah. He says, where are you going to church? I said, I'm going to Church of God over Trent. He said, well, why aren't you going to Catholic church? Because that's how I was raised. I said, well, Dad, I said, it's not. And I didn't really, I really couldn't even give him a good answer because I was, you know, I, I sort of knew, but I said, well, it's just not quite, you know, I, I knew later, I found out later, but I said, my oh, dad is just, he thought I joined a cult. I didn't know it, I didn't know it until later, my cousin told me, after my dad died, my cousin told me he was crushed. He was really concerned, because he thought he didn't know, he didn't understand. Later on, after he got to, you know, find out what it was about, he was all right, but. See, people that are religious, when you start talking about the move of God, they get threatened, they get scared. Because they're used to the same old thing over and over and over. We go to church and rock, blah, 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 and over and over and over again. And when God starts to move and when the Spirit starts to move and things start happening that are beyond the natural, they start to think, wow, this, these leaders of Jesus' day, just like leaders of, of churches today, 
bishops and archbishops and, and they dismiss the move of God as being fanatical or you know, they dismiss belief in the second coming of Jesus Christ as being ridiculous and ah. but you see, I have to go with this. See, people can make up all they want to make up. Most of what religion passes is just made up in the minds of men. But this is God's word. Just reading a few more verses, we're going to close. From that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death in verse 53. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. Verse 55. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves, because the, uh, the, the Jews would always go to Jerusalem for the Passover. They would bring offerings and sacrifices as they were required. And then sought they, when they went there, they sought for Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? Do you think he'll come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. The next chapter talks about the triumphant entry on Palm Sunday. See, Jesus knew the setup was in. The contract was out. They were just looking for the right hit man to do the number on Jesus. They couldn't take him openly because the people respected him. But they had to wait for a time where they could sneak him into a kangaroo court where nobody was looking. And that's what happened. But it was this thing with Lazarus that set the stage because they couldn't deny that he was the son of God. And instead of believing in him, they chose to reject him, just like so many do today. Just like I did for many years until God finally, I got tired of him beating my head. Just like many of you that rejected Christ for so many years, but then finally, thank the Lord, finally, something broke through. We pray for those ones, those Pharisees, those ones who are denying God's word. The ones who want to take down the statues and take down the signs and all that stuff. They, they think they're doing, they think they're doing the, the world a favor. But I pray, and I pray for these ones, that somehow, somewhere, God would break through that stony heart. For those loved ones we've been witnessing to for years. Brother Albert shares about his brothers. Prayed for him for 40 years. Finally got saved. He's going to, what, turn 81 years old or? Your brother, Albert, 81 or 82 years old? We can pray for our loved ones. Oh, and it seems like it's for nothing. But listen, don't stop praying. Don't stop witnessing. Don't stop sharing the word. Because who knows that somewhere down the line, God's going to break that stony heart. Break up that fallow ground. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Anybody have any questions or comments before we close? Yes.